Right, okay. Um, I think I've now got sound. No, it's not good night from me. Right, can people just confirm whether you can hear me, even if the sound is awful? I know there's about a 30 second gap. I don't know what the cause of the problem is, well I can guess um, on this. Right folks, I'm assuming that you're able to hear me at the moment, even though I haven't got the right display um, on the screen. Right, brilliant. Okay, let me explain what's probably happened. Uh, what you can see on the screen at the moment is you can see this down here. And I suspect, uh, I was having trouble with getting all the devices connected to the machine that, um, uh, that we needed for, for me to be able to see and do this. And it all appeared to um, stop working at one point. And I rebooted everything and it all started working again. It now appears that the one device that doesn't want to talk to the laptop is the, uh, the audio input. Uh, so what I've done is I've switched over to the uh, microphone on here which unfortunately means I haven't got my PowerPoint slides at the moment. So I'm going to try keeping that live um, uh, to, uh, to change over uh, to, to, to get the PowerPoint slides. So please bear with me for a moment. Uh, I need to do a slight adjustment to some of my setup. And I'm just going to pull this down to where I can see it, because not only has it killed my microphone off, it's actually stopping me seeing the other screen as well. So uh, I'm going to go silent for a moment. Uh, so just so that you're aware, just so that I can enable this uh, back in on uh, the device that I need it on for sound. So just bear with me one moment. <laughs> Okay, so that should bring the sound back. So what I need to do is actually just lose that completely from, from this screen. So, right. Okay, so we've had a, another rocky start. This is what happens when you try to do too much with your, um, uh, with your live stream. Um, you'll understand why I'm trying to do this in a moment because it, this is one of the questions I'd had earlier. Um, I'll do the best I can with this. It's going to be a little bit complicated. Um, I'll try and fix it whilst the next video is playing when we get to that. But welcome to the show. This proves it's live, not pre-recorded. And I've just realised one other thing as well. It's not being a good day at all. <sighs> the lights weren't on. Oh dear. Right, okay. Right. Deep breaths. Right, here we go. Welcome to the show. And now, please let me be able to advance the line. Yes, I can advance the slides. Quick overview for anyone who doesn't know, the show is live every uh, Sunday night at 7.30 and it's definitely live. Uh, they, everything stays up on, live, on YouTube for a while, so you can always catch up on the replays there and eventually there will be cut down versions with the full version in my academy. Uh, but I'm also putting extracts up onto YouTube as well when time permits, both on this channel, the Ian Studio channel, and also on my, uh, my other channel, which is the, uh, the Lightroom channel, which is, the, I also have a travel one as well. Links are in the side margin and probably down below this video as well on there. <laughs> Andy Wright telling me to chill out, yeah. If I chill out, you won't get anything. I'll just go to sleep. Let's carry on. Uh, yeah, ask questions in chat. Heckle me in chat. You normally do anyway. Uh, and if you're watching this on the replay, I know some of you do. Um, uh, one of the Peters tends to watch on the replay. Uh, so uh, 
and Laws sometimes does as well. So do let me know, stick something in the chat, so just so I know you've been there. Uh, and if you're not already a subscriber, please subscribe, hit the bell icon, and then you know when things are, are happening. If you're watching on the replay, as I say, make sure you leave me a comment, but comment along the other videos on, there, on here as well. And um, I try to uh, like the, the, the videos and share information about it. It's not always as chaotic as, as this at the beginning. Right, the Facebook group. I think most of the people I can see in the chat are um, in, uh, in the Facebook group. And uh, that's the place where during the week we carry on the conversation from the show, uh, things which come up on there, and also uh, sharing of images. I'll provide feedback, pick up on some of the images in the weekly show, as I will be doing tonight. So the link for that, again, down below. Just noticed a comment from Bob saying that no lip sync, that the sound's out of sync. Um, is How bad is it? Or is it just Bob who's got that? Or has anyone else got to out of sync? sound it wouldn't surprise me if you have to be honest uh, but uh, do let me know if you've got that uh, on there uh, there moving on newsletter also have a, a, a newsletter should have gone out today didn't though that'll be going out tomorrow uh, with that with general hints and tips on there uh, yeah Gary has said he's been posting links to other sites um, on the uh, uh, on the channel. Yeah, I'm happy with that. I want the group to be a resource. Uh, it'd be nice if uh, if the other groups can reciprocate or that uh, we can get uh, links in there back to mine. Uh, right, uh, people confirming the sound is fine. Thank you for that. I uh, appreciate that. So what have we got on the show this week? Well, we've got a little bit of news from me. It is another Lightroom special. I've got the three minute challenge and I'll be uh, talking about some of your images, the ones put up onto, um, uh, up on the, um, dum, 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 uh, the Facebook group. Good grief, my mind's gone tonight. Sorry, folks, on that. And we've got the live Q&A as well. So, news from me. Right, well, this is um, an exciting one. I've got a new video up. Just put it online this afternoon which is a tour round the studio. Those of you who've been here will know there's not much, it's not very big, so it's not a long tour. But the point, the point of the video is to explain the changes I have made to make the studio. Well, we're supposed to talk about COVID safe. I'm not gonna say that. I'm going to say what I can do to mitigate the risks. That nowhere is 100% safe from COVID. So we, I shouldn't use that word and I won't use that term. Uh, I have done things to try and mitigate it and reduce the risks if anyone comes here of uh, contracting it. And I believe I've reduced them to a level where I think I can reopen. At least that was the plan until uh, something to midnight on Thursday when we got hit with a whole load more um, uh, lockdown restrictions which basically means, uh, and how that affects the studio, is that if I'm doing things which are in direct connection with the business, in other words, if I am running an event uh, and training somebody one-to-one, -one, I think I'm okay with doing that. What I don't think I can do is run group shoots where there's a fairly large social element to it. So, some of the things I was planning are on hold. If you want to hire the studio, that is possible. And this video on the YouTube channel will walk you through what's changed to explain the, the new setup and what I've changed here, how uh, social distancing is going to work, the precautions I'm taking in terms of uh, wiping down and things like that. So. Please um, have a look at that if you're someone who might want to use the studio or might want to come here. You'll notice the heading on here, and it's not a typo. It says Studio Tours. There is another tour. It's on my website. If you go to the website and you go to 
uh, the full photographer's section and go to studio. Underneath that menu is a virtual tour. A, one of these 360 degree ones. You can virtually walk around the studio and see it in its new configuration. And that was very kindly done for me uh, by Terry Mac McNamara uh, only on Friday, actually. And it's, it's a cracking uh, thing that he's set up and done, done on there. And I know Terry occasionally um, dips in here. If you are watching Terry, I just want to give a really big thank you to you for doing that. I really, really appreciate it. And folks, if you know anyone who needs a 3D tour um, doing, Terry is the person to go to. Uh, please let him know that the referrals come via me um, on, on that, just so that he knows that that's where it's come from. And um, uh, he, he did talk about um, uh, about effectively affiliate um, marketing and things like that. I, I want to help Terry out. So if you know anyone who needs that sort of 3D tour, that 360 degree virtual tour, do send them in his direction. He's, uh, he's done some good work there. So that's my big news for the week. So Q&A. All right. As I've said before, add your questions into the chat. And I'll pick them up there. There will be a delay from me speaking to you hearing me, which means get your questions in quickly. I'll pick up most of the questions at the end. So get them in early on in the, uh, in the proceedings and we'll go from there. And if you've got questions during the week, send them to me at contactme at ianstudio.co.uk and uh, I'll include them in the, in the show. Occasionally I get questions that I can't answer there and then and I postpone. And tonight I've got one of those questions. Now, this is where I, or why I set up this extra camera up here, which is the cause of all the problems I think for the sound. So I just need to do a little bit of moving of windows around and I can start talking about this thing called MIDI to LR. So let me just do that for the moment. Oh, this is awkward. Ah, right, okay. I was viewing the mouse on the um, on the wrong screen, but it was captured onto uh, the other window. So, right, I've got that there. Now, I need Lightroom. I have Lightroom. I've got that. And now I need to change the display. This is where the fun part starts. Right, okay, you can still hear me. Good, brilliant. Right, let me explain what MIDI to LR is all about. MIDI to LR allows you to take one of these, a uh, standard MIDI device. If I take my bit of paper off, you can see what it is. It's the Behringer or Behringer X Touch Mini uh, Mini uh, MIDI controller. It's USB two connected. And it gives me a whole load of dials and buttons to press. The software MIDI to LR allows you to map these buttons and these dials to functions within Facebook. Uh, with Facebook. Oh, I'm having a bad day uh, within uh, Lightroom. So if I pick an image here and I bring that up. Now, I'm just going to put my overlay on there um, because I've mapped these keys to do various things. So, for example, if this works, ah, I need to be in the develop module. <laughs> oh, this machine is struggling. Right. There we We scan the MIDI device. Ah! Therein lies the problem. Let's see what stops working this time. Have we still got sound? Yes. The last USB device you connected to this computer malfunctions. Windows does not recognize it. Oh, for crying out loud. 
Right, okay, what's supposed to happen? I can't, I can't uh, show you properly because it's not working. It's decided it really doesn't want to play tonight. What is supposed to happen and what does happen when I'm set up at home, same machine, is I turn these and the, for example, the exposure will adjust. Contrast and various other functions on there. Um, it does work really well and it's a great device to work with and it's a really good productivity tool within Lightroom. And since I've had it, if I'm doing any major work in Lightroom, I will use this. And I've assigned certain buttons on here, which will do various things, which usually take quite a while. So I have a single button that will do automatic upright corrections. So if my verticals are converging, I can just hit one button and it will automatically try and correct them and take me to the appropriate part within the appropriate section in here. And it really, really does speed things up. Uh, just to be able to do your tweaks by moving your hands over the device and adjusting different things, you can see how quick that is, as opposed to trying to do it with a mouse lining up uh, on there. So it really speeds things up. There is a downside to it. And let me be honest about this. MIDI uh, 2LR is not the most intuitive uh, thing to set up. They do reasonably well. I am going to, if I load a profile I don't need on here, uh, I'm going to put that one called Hue will do, I think. Open that. And actually, I'm. Make sure I hold something to Lightroom, not that it's doing anything. There should be a way to reset this, and I can't remember how to do it uh, on here. Um, there. I can't show you. I was just going to try and clear. Ah, uh, clear all rows. Yeah. What happens then is as I press a button, it will go on the screen on here, it will come up with the appropriate section and you've got to drop down to assign the, the commands to it, which is fine for most commands. But when you want to do certain things, you've got to do things within Lightroom first. And within the plugin manager within Lightroom, uh, you've got this options section, which I'm just going to pull up. Yep, here we go. Um, so if you want to do a series of commands, you have to define them in here first and then say, right, I want to run series of commands one. Or if I want to do local adjustments, you've got to set them up, the presets here first. Um, and things like that. So various filters and other is various keystroke um, items that you might want to use. You have to set them up in here first and then the key press is assigned to one of these numbers. So it is not the most intuitive to set up and getting a combination of keys that work for your workflow can take a little while to set up. On the plus side, if I flip this over, which you should now be able to see, there are um, versions of keys that you are that are previously defined that you can download so you've got that as a start point but it may not work exactly as you like to work in Lightroom so I started with something like this and mine got changed beyond all recognition uh, which is why I have to work with that side and scribble notes on it one day I'm going to re pre uh, redo this and get it all typed up nice and neatly uh, on there but the original question was, do I recommend them? What are my thoughts on it? I think it's a cracking device. I do recommend it. And I would, um, if you are a big Lightroom user, it will save you time. And the other thing to comment about the A and B here means that you can assign everything you've got on there on A, and then you can press B 
and it goes to a completely different mapping. So you can toggle between two different versions of keys like that. The other clever thing that you can do uh, is, well, it says profiles here, you can assign profiles to different uh, parts of, uh, of Lightroom. So I have one that's in the develop module, which I call general, and one in the library module. So the keys will do different things depending whether I'm in develop or in, uh, uh, in, in the library module. So, so that's, that's that. Um, I can't remember who asked the question uh, initially, uh, but it, it seems to work for me and I think it's a good productivity tool. So what I'm going to do now, uh, I'm going to try and get back to uh, my previous setting. I hope I don't lose sound when I do it. Right. Can you still hear me? Yes. Right. Okay. I have got, uh, I've got video uh, on there. I've got sound coming through. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to play in Rick's three minute edit challenge. And for anyone who doesn't know what the three minute edit challenge is all about, uh, we're given images, uh, raw files, and we have just three minutes to do the, uh, to do the edit, both myself and Rick, um, uh, do it. So, right. Um, as we're about to go into that, let me just check the chat here. Um, uh, lack of, yeah, Rick saying the possible problem is lack of power to the, uh, the USB hub um, with their needing a powered USB hub, maybe with that number of devices connected. Um, oh, well, well, I'll try and sort something out, disconnect a few things whilst you watch Rick's uh, three minute edit challenge video. We've had some new ones come in this week and I'm going to sort those out this week, hopefully with uh, uh, with Rick so that the, the, the newbies who've never had one done before will play those in for the next uh, couple of weeks. This week we've got one from uh, from Michael and I think Michael was the very first one we ever did was one of his and this I think is his fourth or fifth one on there um, which uh, be interesting. Now I was also sent a photograph this week to introduce Rick's edit. It was sent to me by Gary Platt. And he wants to know whether this is Rick in a previous life. I don't know. I think it does look a little bit like him. I know it's, uh, I think it's a, a carving from Chatsworth House. And yeah, I've just seen um, sub, uh, Subvids just joined us on the, uh, on the stream. Uh, so, hi, you missed all the uh, confusion right at the beginning with problems with microphones. Hopefully it won't have, uh, have that uh, coming up. But I'm going to play in Rick's edit while I try and sort, all, sort out the problems that we've got uh, on this. So, see you in a few minutes. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to another three-minute Lightroom edits video challenge thing. Right, um, my name's Rick Bradbury. I'm recording this really for Ian's live stream. And this evening, um, we are editing an image from Michael Walsh. Walsh? Walsh? I, I, I can't say your surname. Sorry, dude. Um, from Michael. There we go. <laughs> and this is the fourth image, I think, um, that we've looked at of his. So thank you very much for sending all those in. And without further ado, let's jump into Lightroom. So, oh, I should have made a cup of coffee before I did this. Losing my voice. Right, there we go. Three minutes on the clock. And let's go. So here we are in Lightroom. Um, just the raw file has been brought in, which is a NEF file. So it's Nikon, uh, a D810, I think, if I remember rightly, um, shot on the 24-70 f2.8 uh, at f11 ISO 200, 100th of a second, 48 millimeters. So near as damn it, 50 mil. Okay, right. So let's see what we're going to do with this. Now, um, we're going to first go to... Oh, Lens correction, not a whole lot happening there, which is good. That's fine. And I'm going to jump in. I think I am going to go black and white with this. Um, yeah, I'm going to go black and white with this one. Now, it's dark in exposure. Um, however, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad exposure, depending um, because it depends on the image you're going to go for. So 
Um, we're going to go to black and white. Um, I am going to bump the exposure just a touch on how we're going to do the rest in curves um, to begin with. So, oops, there we go. And let's raise this up. Bring in the highlights and uh, shadows. Okay, we've got detail that we can bring back there. Um, which, whoa, come on, what are you doing, laptop? Right, uh, which brings up a bit of noise, but not too much. Um, now, I don't think it needs that much, really. Um, I just want to start to see the edge of the shape of the gun there. Um, whites, we can increase a little bit. Not got a much headroom on that. Um, there we go, black's just a touch. We'll do a little bit of global contrast, probably go just a little bit further on the exposure. And then we'll probably do the rest down here. See, lights can come up just a little bit. And we'll probably then going to jump to the white balance, because uh, it's amazing how much of a difference the white balance makes when you're dealing with black and white as you shift it to the warmer Kelvin values, or of course, uh, towards magenta or otherwise I'm running out of time right here we go so highlights can come up just a little bit bit more contrast on there and we are going to now go for a little bit of texture a little bit of clarity some dehaze and then some sharpening for the last 20 seconds and um, take the noise reduction off so got mask detail there I may, if I had more time, even add noise to this. Uh, but there we go. Let's see. Uh, before and after. Um, before and after. Oof. There is more I would have liked to have done to this. Um, shush. Quiet. Right. There's definitely more I would have liked to have done to this. Um, but I shall be uh, back momentarily um, with some feedback on the image. Um, but for now, back to the live stream with Ian. Yeah. 
giving me something that they try. And they sort of try one other thing. Okay. Right, how's that? Right, okay, wonderful. We've got sound again. I really don't understand what's going on here tonight. Uh, the way I've just fixed it is that I've put, I've connected the microphone to the camera direct and I've uh, sort of enabled that sound. So you should be hearing me now. Uh, just I need to work out what on earth I've got on my screen, where on earth I'm up to. Because I appear to have lost a few screens. Right. Right, okay, right, let's, um, let's carry on. I think we're okay. Oh. Yeah, um, okay, now, yeah, sound is back. Kev says it's out of sync. Could somebody tell me just how badly out of sync it is? Uh, there are things I can do to try and fix that, but I, I need to know sort of, a approximate amount and I'll try and fix that during the next um, uh, the next video right okay it's moving on anyway we're looking at Lightroom tonight and I've got various techniques I want to talk about if you can hear me um, the first one is um, about split toning so I'm going to pull up uh, Lightroom which I have here and hopefully yep you've got the display there and I'm going to look at this particular image when uh, Lightroom catches up with me uh, an image from three sisters the three sisters at Stockport Garrick it's actually a play I was in and it's a very um, one of my favourite theatre images uh, here, because it just captures the mood of, uh, of the play. Anyone who's into theatre um, will know that um, the, the, the Three Sisters by Chekhov is not a happy play. Um, most of Chekhov's stuff isn't. There are actually quite, some quite funny moments in it, um, but it's, um, they're, they're quite, it's quite a tragic situation. Uh, and it just captures the mood. I was about to go on stage and I just happened to have the camera to hand and I grabbed this shot and it's become one of my favourites. But what's interesting about it is the toning that I've done on it. What I'm going to do is, the first thing I'm going to um, do is create a snapshot of those settings. So we've got it saved. So we'll call that final edit. So that's the, the final thing in there. And now I'm just going to reset it. And, ooh, that's very, um, very orange in there, probably because I'm so used to seeing it uh, without the, um, uh, in, a, in its desaturated form. But not only that, I also know I managed to lose the color profile on my monitor, which doesn't help matters. That stopped, um, uh, everything stopped working this evening. Right, anyway, um, thing with this, now it's reset. What I wanted to do with it was to give it that slight sepia look to it. And the, the trick with doing something like that was first of all, just to get the exposure right. And I just want to bring the exposure up slightly on there. Bring the highlights down, losing detail here. And now it's a case of bring down the saturation so it becomes a much more desaturated image to something like that. Having got to that point, now is the time to look at split toning. And let me explain a little bit what split toning does. We tend to think of split toning as something uh, that's done with monochrome images, with black and white images. And in reality, I'm a bit worried now. I'm about to change the display on here and I don't know whether I'm going to lose sound. Hmm. 
No. Right, I've got the sound on there, but I haven't got on, on the other. Right, okay, so I can't, um, can I zoom the screen? This is gonna mess everything up. But I can zoom it that much. Ah, what happens if I try shrinking me? That will do. Having to do all this live because when I change the scene, I disappear, the, uh, the sound disappeared. Right, okay, there we go. I'm trying to give you the biggest screen possible I can uh, to see what's going on. Right, okay. The, the way split toning works is it takes the highlights and adds a color over the top of it and takes the shadows and adds a different color over the top of it. Now, the trick with split toning is to... The, the mistake people make is they tend to bring up a slider and say, well, it's not making any difference at all doing the color, doing anything. That's because you have to bring the saturation up first before you can see it. So the usual trick is to bring the saturation right up on both at the start and then choose the hue that you want so that you can see what we're we're getting so I'm going to want a sort of sepia look with it and maybe a more of a deeper brown in the shadows so that's the sort of thing that I want but it's way too saturated so now I can just bring things back bring the saturation back on both until I get the look that I want and that is so sort of fairly close to the look that I was after uh, with it. And you can see the difference it's made. If I turn that off, it's subtle, but it just gives it that brown sepia, that dated look with it. And maybe bring a bit more saturation in on the highlights with that. And again, let's just toggle it on and off. That's um, the desaturated without the split toning, and that's with it in. And it just gives that color effect uh, to it. So that's the, um, the effect of split toning and how we would use it. The other place we would use it, if I go to a different image, and actually you can see here that I've, here, here's what I said earlier. You see this black and white image, the YouTube star uh, image that I dealt with. Last time I did the Lightroom special, that's got a split tone on it. That's a black and white image, monochrome image to start with monochrome. Toning. What I've done is the brown hue for the highlights with a bluer hue for the shadows. And that, that's a, quite a nice effect there that you get within Lightroom uh, doing that. The, uh, uh, the brown blue split and uh, I rather like that with um, uh, uh, with my split tones on um, uh, on the monochrome images so that's how you would use split toning and an example of where you'd use it that perhaps you wouldn't normally think of putting split toning on a color on a color image um, desaturate it then apply it and that um, and that seems to work on that so Let's try and go back to my standard setup. Right, yes. And I'm back here and I've still got sound. Brilliant. Okay, so next, let's move on. And back to the three minute edit challenge. This time, my edit. Now, one thing to say about this is when you see it, you'll notice something very unusual about it. I actually recorded this very, very early on, uh, as soon as Michael uh, submitted his images, and he was one of the first to submit, uh, I just plowed through and did my edits on them and did my recordings. So when you see the setup here, it's pre-Doctor Who figures on the desk, it's pre-having the nice setup here, it's a monitor by itself, so it's a slightly different setup. But it's still me doing the. Hello, welcome to another three minute Lightroom edit challenge. 
Uh, in these challenges, we have images that we haven't seen before, and the aim is to edit them within three minutes. Uh, today's image has been supplied to me by Michael. So let me start the, uh, the timer, head over to the develop module and see what I can do with this one. So let's go full screen so you can see things a little bit better. Uh, D for the develop module oh, will be if I've got the right focus. So D. Right. OK. First thing to say about this, it seems to be a very underexposed image. I don't know whether that's uh, intentional or not. I prefer things to be a, have a bit more detail into them. So I'm going to bring that up. Uh, now I can see what's going on here a little bit better uh, on that. And I'll try bringing the shadows up a bit. Right. I want to sort out the white balance on it because it doesn't look right on the skin tones. So let's just set that to, no, what am I doing? White balance to flash on there. That's looking a little bit better. I do think this ought to be in black and white though. Um, so I am going to just go to my standard black and white, which is black and white 03 on there. Close. And that's starting to look quite nice and mysterious. So the fact that I'm in there, I want a little bit more clarity to it, get a bit more bite in the the image and perhaps a little bit more contrast. I'm going to bring that exposure up just a fraction more and bring the highlights down so that we don't blow out. That's starting to look a little bit more moody, this. Now crop-wise, I've got 1 minute 30 left on this. Let's bring that in a little bit tighter. I can afford to bring that in a little bit either side on this. We change the overlay. That's better. I see a bit more what I'm doing. And I quite like that as it is, actually. Do I need to do much else? Nice and sharp on the face. Maybe a tad too sharp on it. I don't know. Bring the texture down just very slightly on it. How's that? Yeah, I think I prefer that um, on there. Um, I've still got 48 seconds left. There's not much else I want to do on this one. Um, I think I'd like to see a bit more detail over this side. So let's see if I, my 38 seconds, whether I can do it with a graduated filter and uh, reset everything, bring the exposure up just a little bit and mm, something long there actually exposure is not doing it it's the shadows i want to bring up uh, no just bring a little bit more put the highlights down and then the exposure up yeah and just get that extra little bit of detail in there uh, on it so let's have a look at the before and after on this so that was before and that's me out of time and that is the after so uh, thank you uh, Michael for supplying this image I'll uh, make a few comments later in the in the video about the composition and the techniques on it but what you've just seen is what I would do in three minutes uh, to the image uh, in terms of the the post processing uh, there's probably other things I would do with uh, with it um, if I had a bit more time uh, I would try to uh, make sure there's a little bit more contrast between the background and the arm here, uh, but that's a minor thing on there. Uh, so that's that's my edit on that done in three minutes. So thanks for submitting the image. I'll uh, talk about it a little bit later in the uh, in the video. Uh, see you then. Okay, so we're back. I've just been looking at the chat and there's something very odd going on. Um, Bob has said that there is a, a sound delay of three to five seconds, which is way too much really to, uh, to work sensibly uh, on this. Uh, let me, I'm just going to do a clap and see if it really is that far out and whether the sound comes before the the video so three two one ah bob is saying that lip sync is now good right so 
what about uh, everyone else? Have you got a good lip sync with it? Because if it's a long way out, I, I'll abandon this for tonight and uh, uh, do, uh, come back and do Lightroom next week uh, with it all working properly rather than persevering and uh, not being able to communicate properly. Right, okay. Um, while I'm waiting for that, because I know there is the delay on the line anyway, let me just talk about David saying 3.5 seconds. Ah, uh, yeah, the uh, um, the sound would be good on the videos. Yeah, it's. I think it's just too much uh, to carry on because when I get into doing the Lightroom stuff. Um, right, the video, right, Terry says the clap was about four seconds after the video clap. Right, now I can't adjust that in um, the broadcasting software because in theory, the adjustment should be, it should always be the other way around. There's an inherent delay with HDMI when you send that over. So normally what happens is that the, the sound comes first. Now I've had this happen once before when I've been doing private recordings uh, where the, uh, the sound out of the camera, if I would do the, the sound from the camera, it just goes out of sync like that. I don't know why that happens. I don't know why it's not working on here. I know how to cure it on the, uh, on the system here. It's a reboot of it, but if I reboot, that will terminate the stream. Uh, so I, I loo lose it. Um, uh, Terry is saying, I'm happy to carry on. Can you turn, the, turn your video off? Uh, not easily to, uh, to do that. I, I suppose if I try turning the camera off and on again and see whether that comes back, I'll do that as a last, uh, as a last uh, resort and then if that hasn't, if it's still that sort of distance out, when I'm in Lightroom, especially as I can't do full screen on Lightroom either, the things I'm trying to teach aren't going to work properly. Let me try just rebooting the camera and see whether that solves it. If it doesn't, then I'm going to terminate it for the night uh, on there. Right, okay, so I'm I'm back. The camera has been uh, reset on there. I'm going to do the uh, the clap and count again, and let's just see what the um, uh, uh, what the di uh, the difference is. Uh, Subvid says yes. Try a reboot. We'll still be here. Actually, no, you won't because it will terminate the live stream, and I can't. You can't stop a live stream and restart it again. Uh, it's it just disappears. It, it becomes a final video at that point. So that that's that's one of the limitations of streaming. Uh, that you you can't you can't swap PCs in. Uh, ah, we're in sync. Let me do the clap anyway. Just double check this. Three, two, one. Right, wonderful. Okay. Oh dear me. Don't you just love technology, eh? Right. Okay. Let's persevere then. If we're in sync, I'm losing viewers though. Not surprising. Right, okay, so let's have a look at some of your images, uh, folks. It's in sync, but now crackly. Oh, right. Um, right, is it crackly for everyone else while I carry on? Uh, right, the images. I wanted to share a couple that Gary posted in the Facebook group during the week. Uh, this one showing um, basically a, a lot of different uh, street signs. The way the composite of that, the way they were all put together was done, was actually using Lightroom. And similarly with, 
with this one, you can use Lightroom to composite your images together. And you actually do it in the print module. So I'm going to try going over there. Right, we've got lots of OKs in sync but crackly uh, on here. Um, again, if I just ask the question, is it crackly for everyone? Right, let's, okay, let's carry on. Over to Lightroom. And yeah, I've got sound on there, good. Right, uh, what I'm going to try and show, let me go to a folder in here. And use one uh, strawberry venom for the sake of argument. No, that's not a good one. Um, I need more than a couple of images. Santorini will work nicely with this. So Santorini, to actually do a montage like that, I can do it in the print uh, module. I go over to print, and we create a custom package. Now, I've got some already defined over here. Uh, I've got my triptych one. Uh, which is quite a good one to do it with. I'm just going to bring that, that up so you can see it. And basically, what I've got here is this one's done as a contact sheet. And by just then specifying three different images, I get a, a nice triptych like that. And I change the page size. I could just um, so, uh, say the top, bring the top in a little bit, the bottom in a bit and to give the example that Gary had on the first one I brought the right out and the left Ooh, wrong way left and right out there and change the width ah I've got to keep square there's the there's the thing take that off change the width and we end up with those sort of bars uh, so I can choose the section of image that I want to uh, to show. Maybe not the best ones to, to show this with, but you can imagine creating an image of that uh, sort of style. You can get uh, quite um, clever with these. So I've got some others that I made up on here, multi-print. So I've got one that looks like this. Oh. A very old logo on there. Leave that on, but I can then populate each of these with different images. And the way that's done, it's under custom package, and you just add in um, images that you want. So if I say I want uh, to put a three by seven, I'm going to pull it over onto this page. I can then adjust that to what size I want. And I can just sort of build this up to look as I want it to. It always tries to find a blank space to put in uh, on there. So I've now put that one on and I can stick an image in it. And you can just sort of build it up that sort of way. Um, not the best demo on it, but that's the sort of thing that Gary has been uh, has been doing with, uh, with his images to to build up something that, uh, that looks like that. So let me just check. No, not crackly, but okay, not crackly. Oh boy, I don't know. Right, okay, let's just move on with this. I want to just talk about a few images from, um, um, uh, from John as well. He, po he posted quite a nice set um, which would make quite a good montage like this where you put them together as a as a single image so I don't know if you're watching or not John um, tonight but a set of images like this so these obviously at Blackpool they're all centered around what appears to be a murmur 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 a flight of uh, a whole load of starlings so we've got them flying around just a little bit in the background there 
and then a close up on there. And I really like this one, the one person and the single bird flying by and then uh, the starlings um, at rest on the uh, one of the roofs there. So this would make a really good sort of set of images to actually prepare and display in that way that we've just been talking about in Lightroom uh, on there. Yeah, the Leaning Tower of Blackpool uh, subvid says, yeah, I don't know whether John uh, is actually a Lightroom user or not. I think most of those images have come out of uh, a phone, um, which, which is fine or might be a, a compact camera. I'm not sure uh, with those. One thing, John, if you're watching this, if you're not, um, you, you may not be able to justify having something like Lightroom if that's the sort of camera that you're using. Have a look at getting the, there's a couple of programs that you can get for, for phones. And the one I recommend is Snapseed. Snap as in snapping your fingers, seed as in plant. And it's a free program and it will allow you to do the sort of adjustments that I'm doing in Lightroom uh, to images to uh, make them a bit more contrasty, to remove any haze and things like that. So that's something to, to possibly think about, John, um, if you're shooting with uh, on a camera phone. As I, I suspect those are from the aspect ratio on there. They're either camera phone or compact camera. Uh, so something like that might be a good tool for you if you're shooting on the phone. And you can correct leaning towers of Blackpool as well with that. Oh, that's an old image from Gary. I didn't mean that one. Uh, but... We're ready to go over to Lightroom again, and I want to show a skin softening and lip change um, tutorial on one particular image. So let me move over to Lightroom. And... Right, so quick collection. Lightroom is so slow at the moment. Right, this is um, for it. I'll go to the basic module. I, what I'm going to do is I've already got a version as photographed here. That's how it was taken. No, it's not. I've got skin softening on that one. Right, okay, I'm just going to do a complete reset on it. There we go, complete reset. And let me show you the edit on this and how we would also change the color of the lips. Right, so the first thing to do is to correct that exposure. Now, I've got a problem here in that, as I say, I've lost my color profile on here. So I've got to try and judge this between two monitors to make sure I get it right. So I'm bringing that up a little bit. The profile, right. I'm just gonna browse the profiles for this. And let's see what we've got with the camera ones. Don't want black and white with it. Oh, come on, move. There's the camera. That's the camera matching. And I'm just going to go with neutral on there uh, with it. Or standard? No, neutral. Neutral is the better one for that. And then close on there. White balance is going to be flash on it. And I'm taking the saturation down just a little bit. So it's that slightly desaturated look, which I think works quite well for this. So we're not too far off there now. Just bring the exposure a little bit more. And I'm reasonably happy with that for the exposure. Now, the skin softening. Now, I've talked about this technique before, but let me just run through, through it again. What I'm going to do with this is I'm going to use the texture slider, and I'm just going to bring it all the way down until I get that nice, soft skin look. And I'd say that's probably about where I want it. So we're about minus 77 on there. 
Now, what that has done is it's also softened areas that we don't want softening, like the hair and the eyes uh, with it. So we want to bring that back and we bring that back using an adjustment brush. So the adjustment brush is K or button up there. Reset it all with uh, double clicking on effect. It is all reset actually with this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint back what I've taken out. So I've taken out uh, minus 77 on the texture. So I'm just going to bring that back up to plus 77 thereabouts. But I'm also just going to add in a little bit of clarity as well. And you'll see the effect that this makes. So now I want a, a brush. Let me just check what we've got here. I'm actually just going to go full flow on there. Um, reasonable size. So I'm using the scroll on the mouse to just start painting back in. You can see on the edges of the hair the different that, that makes around the edge there. And areas like the fingers, just those edges on there. And I'm going to zoom in on the image and if I do this on the lips again you can see it, how it's brought all that back in I tend to do just a little bit around the edge of the nose so we get that detail there and then particularly around the eyes and you see just how much that's coming in on the eyebrows and on the eyes so do it over here just paint that back texture and clarity so they the eyes really begin to pop now and zoom out and that gives me the sort of effect maybe a little bit on the fingers there a bit on the the petals that i want maybe just a touch around that edge as well but that's giving me a nice soft skin effect on there and that's a, i find one of the quickest ways of doing skin softening now, the other uh, one I want to talk about is something that I did on the live stream ooh, a good couple of months back about changing the, the color of lipstick. But I want to show you a slightly different method because we've now got this hue adjustment available in Lightroom uh, that we can use uh, to, uh, uh, to adjust the... Um, uh, the color of the lips. So I'm also going to do it instead of painting on, I'm going to use the ellipse, the radial tool, the ellipse mask on here. Right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just draw an ellipse that covers the lips. An ellipse lips, an ellipse ellipse. Come on, rotate round. Pull it out just a little bit and up and out of fashion. Oh, I need to bring it out just a bit more and round a bit more by the looks of it. Can be a bit fiddly doing it this way. But... So, on there. I'm going to put the overlay mask on, which is O. And there, that tells me I've done the usual thing and I need to invert it. So we've got it on there that way. But now, what we want to do, we just want the lips to be the selected area. I'm going to zoom in so we can see this perhaps a little bit better. Oh! Didn't mean that. Got our radial filter on here, and I can see some effects on there. I thought I'd reset that. Clearly, I haven't. So, undo that. And what I'm going to do, maybe get a bit more screen real estate. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a range mask and I'm going to use a color range mask and I'm going to just pick the red on 
and you can see a pretty good job we've just got the red areas selected now and so I'm just going to affect uh, the lips with what I'm about to do so I can take the overlay off with the knowledge that the only thing I've got selected is the lips so now I can use this hue adjustment I can just change the color of the lips to whatever I want and we can see okay we've missed a little bit there so I'm just going to add in another drop in there and capture all of that. Oh, it all. There we go. And we, have I got all of them? Maybe a little bit more to pick out that area. And, yeah, we've just got a little bit on the outside. I'm just going to undo that slightly, go back a couple of steps. That's more or less it uh, with that range mask on there. So if I come up, come out of the range mask, out of the um, radial tool, and zoom out to fill the screen you can see blue lips on the image uh, on there it's just a different way of doing that selective uh, color adjustment slightly different to the method i showed um, a couple of months back uh, on the live stream but i thought it's worth um worth going through it uh, on here uh, while i was doing the skin softening technique so Right, let's have a look at some more of your images, uh, folks. I've got some images from uh, James that I want to, to just uh, show because I, because I like them. Simple as that, no other reason. Posted these to the group this week, and uh, this including the, um, the, the, the place down in Cardiff, uh, the big uh, concert venue there. Uh, I particularly... Uh, like it because it uh, reminds me of Torchwood, Doctor Who reference um, there uh, for me. Torchwood is directly below there. Uh, so we've got that and a different angle on it. And this, I think, is a lovely use of an extreme wide angle uh, with, the, with the shot and how we've got that distorted image. And that goes back to what we were looking at last week, uh, distortion. And this is a different type of distortion but it, it's been used for effect. So I wanted to share that because lovely image, nicely processed on there. And then another one, again, harks back to what I was doing last week with um, some image. It's again a wide angle uh, shot, uh, a form of distortion, making the ocean look much bigger than it actually is. But the crop on it, very similar to one of the crops that I was talking about last week, about having the pier coming in uh, from one side. So really nice shot, James. I don't know whether you're watching, uh, but if you are, um, great. Thanks for submitting. Right. OK. Let me just have a look at the chat before I move on uh, on here and see what's going on. Uh, right. Uh, Gary is asking, what are the benefits of using that method over using the brush, using the ellipse tool over the brush? Um, right. The benefits of it, really, if, you were, if you're better at controlling the ellipse tool than I am, it's a much more, it's, I just find it an easier way just to highlight an area it's also just a different way of doing it uh, with the brush you, you can be painting for a while you're never going to get the edges right so you're still going to have to do that masking out that i did uh, on there and if you're really if you're using the ellipse tool a lot, i don't tend to use it very much uh, you can actually drag it and position it very very quickly I can't on here because the machine is just so sluggish uh, with running everything else, um, and especially as it's not helping me at all tonight. Right, 
with all that, I'm moving on. The next thing I was going to talk about was spot color. I'm not going to talk spot color, much to the relief of uh, Rick Bradbury, uh, because I know Rick does not like spot color. Um, I was going to do it just uh, because I know there's one or two people who who have uh, done it. I know Ga I know Gary has done it in the past. I don't think he does it very much now, but he has done it in the past. So I was going to show it, but uh, the consensus tends to be photographers hate it, clients love it. Um, I'm going to give it a miss uh, because of everything else that's going wrong tonight. I'm, I've had enough. <laughs> I've got a couple of other things just to show you instead. Right, um, image feedback. I've got an image from John that he wanted some information on, wanted me to see whether I could rescue it. Now, I've got my slides in the wrong order because I need to do... Um, right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to play in the next uh, feedback video the uh, pre-recorded video, which is the feedback on the three minute uh, challenge. I'm going to do that at this point because I need to change uh, Lightroom catalogs that I'm working with and I can do that while the video is, uh, is playing. So let me play that in and then I'll do my feedback after Rick's and then I'll come on to uh, the, um, this image rescue section. So let's do that. Okay, and we're back in Lightroom. So thanks again, Michael, for sending this image in. Um, now, if we have a look at the before, obviously it's a dark image. Uh, the lighting is coming from one side, um, shot through um, a gobo cookie, yeah, whatever you want to refer, refer to it as, um, to create the shape of like a window um, on the background. Um, so it will change the pattern of light on the subject, of course, as well. And it adds to some kind of mood. Now, with there being so much shadow here, um, we do kind of lose the shape of the character, um, elements of the gun potentially down there. Of course, we can um, increase shadows there. We could even do a you know gradient filter just to do it locally, um, for example. So we could, I know, I know I'm breaking the rules and further adds in the image, but here we go. You, know, you could do a gradient and drag it across. Um, and make some changes on that. Why would I take the sharpening down? Right, and, you know, increase the exposure of that zone there um, to help bring some of that detail up. Of course, you know, there's more work you can do um, with more time, uh, of course, um, at that point. Now, I'll show you what we'll do. We will delete that. So we'll go back to my actual original edit. Um, and I think I changed the shadows, but I can't remember to what. So I'll back them off a bit. There we go. Um, it is a little bit dark. Again, I said um, during the beginning of the edit, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily wrong or incorrect. At the end of the day, there's no such thing as a correct exposure. Whether you're a light meter from Sekonic or some other brand or otherwise, it's just, it's subjective. Um, there's always something that you're trying to prioritize in terms of within an image, whether it's something within the highlight and midtones shadow ranges sometimes you have to compromise and pick one and go for it and do the work later sometimes you have to bracket take multiple exposures so yes it's a bit dark but depends on what you're looking to do at the end of it now my go-to is to shoot things a little bit brighter although i will back the exposure off if it adds to the mood with a view to what i'm going to do later and um, obviously Pushing this file, taking it to black and white, we've got highlights areas down here, definitely a highlight down here on the stock of the gun, um, elements in the skin, and obviously the face and the rest of it in shadow. So there's only so much we can do with the raw latitude that we have um, before it starts to get a little bit messy. You know, if you try and push the highlights too much, then um, we're not even really halfway between default and the top, and we're starting to get a little bit nasty have a highlight here on the hand losing detail different cameras different sensors handle this well and um, my 5d mark ii likes to hold highlights it does that really well but on shadows you bring shadows up it's noisy um, as hell so it just doesn't look any good at all and um, so different sensors react differently and um, we've got a bright part here uh, which could potentially take the eye away and it's kind of fighting in contrast against 
the darker area here and the gun is just like spilling past and, and hitting the hand there. Um, not so much you could do. I feel like you're probably balanced out in camera exposure a little better, you know, with a little bit of fill or a reflector. Not too much, don't want to light the whole scene, it takes away from the drama and the mood, um, but maybe just a little bit. Um, we've got a couple of sensor marks to clean up here. Maybe the marks on the wall, but that's a, a sensor mark there. At the end of the day, if you've got sensor dust marks, it shows you're using your camera, so good on you. <laughs> um, but overall, it's fine. I like it. It's moody. The guy's got a good attitude. Um, it's nice and sharp. I mean, it's an older style of image in terms of older outfit, older look. Um, and you are kind of feel, obviously, he's holding a Tommy gun. Um, so I would probably make it look a little bit older by adding some grain in. Um, in post production, which of course we can do if I can remember where it is. There we go, I can find it down here. Um, so we can make it look a little less sharp, if you will, or a little less clinical that a lot of digital files tend to these days because we get so fixated on resolution and sharpness. Um, I think there are times when it's time to back that off a little bit or kind of undo some of that or maybe intentionally soften the imaging camera. A few things you can do. Um, to get that done, which can add to an image that you're trying to create and to tell a story. Uh, but overall, um, I like it. Oh, let's have a look at the framing. Well, that's not the right overlay. There we go. Um, Composition-wise, don't mind it at all. It's fine. Um, we've left enough space for the gun. We could have copy or text if needs be. It could be used for a promo for, say, a theatre piece. Who knows? Um, who knows? I like that you've included the light through, um, you know, the window frame there. Um, rather than kind of cutting it off. So I don't mind this framing at all. I wouldn't do anything with the crop on this one. Um, so nicely done. Let's get rid of the crop tool. Um, just one more time, we will hit the before and after, and the before and after. Now, oh, I mentioned that this was a little bit bright um, here on the thumb. Um, it tends to be a bit of lighter kind of a skin, a bit flatter, and obviously the nail reflects. You could burn that down a little bit, of course, in post just to, to deal with that. So there's elements that you could improve um, spending a bit more time on it. But overall, cool shot. Right, um, enough rabbiting on from me. Back to Ian. Right, OK, thanks uh, for that, Rick. And uh, let me go over to Lightroom and uh, give my uh, feedback on this. So, um, yeah, it's... Um, I, I like the idea, I like the moodiness of it. My main complaint, if there is one, is that uh, it was just that little bit underexposed and that we had to do work to bring that detail back in, uh, in post-production. Uh, so do try and get that, um, um, that exposure right at the time of, uh, of creating the image. The other problem that it's got is the detail round here on the gun. The gun is the significant part of it. It tells the story, it's the gangster look on there, but we're losing bits of it that we can't quite see. Um, I can't tell whether we're losing some of the, uh, of the gun there. Is that the line at the bottom of it? If it is, we've just lost the bottom of it um, in the shot. And, and that's just one of my pet hates is just losing a, the edge of something on the frame like that. Um, if you're going to, if something's going to exit the frame, let, let it exit the frame properly, not just a, a little bit of it to, uh, off the edge. So I'd like to see a little bit more space at the bottom on the image um, on there. So perhaps zoom out just a little bit, maybe even a vertical format with it to be able to see the top of the, the window gobo on there and a bit more light around this area. I like having half the face in shadow, but I think it's a shame we're losing the detail of the gun here. Now that can be solved a number of ways. And we can pro you could probably solve it very simply with just a reflector uh, or even just a bit of white card just out of shot here so that the light that's coming in from this side bounces back and just adds a a tiny amount over on this side and by doing it with a small bit of card down here it will avoid it going onto the face as well uh, I think would work with that 
I think black and white's the right thing to do with it. You know what? After what we were talking about earlier, I think a splitter also work with that. So maybe with it. So something like that. Oh, by the way, the balance from being the blue side to the brown side. So I think something around I think that might actually work. Yeah, I've broken my own rules as well as Rick breaking them and in doing an additional edit on there. But yeah, uh, nice shot. Thanks for submitting it, um, uh, Michael. And uh, it was interesting revisiting it because I it's been so long since I actually recorded the edit on there that I'd completely forgotten all about what I'd done with it uh, on there. Right, okay, so back to where we are. Image rescue. Uh, John posted this image on um, the Facebook group asking, could anything be done to rescue it? Right, well, funny you should say that, John, because let's have a look here in Lightroom. So, let me find the image. And this is up on the, uh, the hills, very misty uh, sort of day. So, the first thing I would do with an image like this is, well, I think the first thing I'm going to do is actually the dehaze filter, uh, because I want to see what detail we've actually got. And I'm... I'm going to whack it all the way up, not because I want to whack it all the way up. I just want to see what's there. Right. What that's told me is, as you can probably see, it's very, very blocky uh, effect in the sky. So we, we're definitely not going to be able to go very far with that. It also tells me there is nothing up there. I was, wasn't sure whether uh, there was anything to recover up in that area. So I know, now know that there isn't. So I can come so far with that. Um, contrast, if I bring the contrast up, that will help me get some more of the detail here. A little bit on the exposure, we'll bring some of that back, and a little bit of clarity. There. Now, we've also got to adjust the, uh, the white balance. Now, because this was a JPEG, especially after it being on um, uh, on Facebook, which is why we've got that blocky effect, because Facebook absolutely crushes your images uh, when they're up there. So if I'm working with those, no wonder I'm not getting a decent result. Uh, so I'm just going to bring up a little bit more, a little bit more exposure and the vibrance. Maybe a touch of saturation, not too much on there. So we're starting to see something with that. Now the white balance with it. I'm trying to work out whether I want to position that white balance. I tend to like things just a little bit warmer than reality. So I probably, with this, not much, just perhaps just plus five on there. Now, the next thing to do to try and rescue this is to think about the crop on it. Now, I'm working with a low resolution image here, so it's not going to be brilliant. But if I crop this, there are a couple of things. I don't like this little bit down here. I either want all of it or none of it. So as we can't have all of it, we're going to have none of it. So I'm just going to bring that up to something like that. And because the sky is not adding anything, with that, I'm just going to bring that down. And effectively, we've now made it into a sort of panorama. But this area, I don't think is adding much. So I just bring that across a little. Maybe a touch in on this side. Let's have a look at that. I think that's about the best I'm going to get with it, to be honest. Uh, that's not going to, um, really not going to work uh, any better than that. It's, a, it's not a brilliant image to start with, I'm afraid. I know what you're trying to achieve, John. Um, kudos for trying, but these really misty scenes are really hard to work with. 
and working with a Facebook crushed image is even harder uh, to actually get anything that will work uh, sensibly. So I think maybe a little bit up on the highlights. And that's probably about the best I can do with it, I'm afraid. So hopefully that's helped a little uh, on there. So that's all I can, uh, I can offer on that one, I'm afraid, John. Right, I want to share another image that was posted, um, which is an interesting one because it, it highlights something else. Um, James Bissett posted this image, um, which uh, he said, I think it was taken with an app on the phone, but using a program called FIMO, uh, or, which simulates different film stocks on there. Maybe it was... Maybe it was with some form of compact camera, I'm not sure. Uh, because looking at the image, it's got the date burnt in on it. So personal hatred of mine is dates burnt in on images. Why? Because if I go back over to Lightroom, and uh, no, 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 and that, and that. So back over here in Lightroom, grid, and the images. I just want to show something on this one. Develop. Because if I correct those verticals, which I am always wanting to do, I'll try auto, see what happens. Yeah, it would tend to um, distort the, uh, the time on there. It's not too bad actually on this one, but sometimes if you've got a big distortion, that you're trying to do, you end up with a, a time halfway through and things like that. So the general advice is don't burn the date and time in an image. Um, it, I don't think it works on there. But what I did want to mention was particularly about this program, uh, at FIMO, if that's how you pronounce it, for um, uh, simulating film stock. I know quite a few people like to do that. Of course, there is another uh, alternative, and that's you just buy a roll of film and stick it into a film camera. But uh, there you go. Actually, probably cheaper to buy the app these days than to buy a roll of film. But uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, final few images to share. And I wanted to share these because I thought this particular one uh, from Gary, this veiled vestule virgin at Chatsworth, I thought was absolutely stunning, the detail on the face in there, uh, a carving which makes it look as though you are looking through a veil. Uh, absolutely stunning statue, that, and well captured by, uh, by Gary. And the black and white treatment works perfectly for it. Another one of Gary is, uh, again at Chatsworth. Um, Gary, you might want to put in the, the chat. I'm intrigued to know whether you were actually working for them or you just managed to get some form of sort of permission uh, to do that, um, uh, to, to photograph there. Uh, and if it is that you got permission, I'd like to know how, um, because it looks like a great place to photograph. But a cracking shot, uh, well illuminated on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the room. Right. Right, okay, let's have a look, final chance in chat, see what we've got in there, any questions? Um, yeah. Oh, Kev's saying that moving the Lightroom slider is killing the audio. Um, yeah, having some problems tonight uh, with it. Um, And as Rick says, the laptop's just not powerful enough. And yes, I am looking to uh, to replace it. Just a matter of finding the right one um, uh, to do it. Um, yeah. Right. Oh, Gary's saying you are allowed to shoot on a walkthrough tour at Chatsworth. Right. Um, might have to go and visit Chatsworth at some point then. That looks quite uh, quite interesting. Right, n no particular questions on there other than what the hell's happened to the sound. Um, the Facebook group, I don't know whether anything new has appeared there whilst we've been online uh, to, uh, uh, to talk about. 
Oh, that's the now over to the group. Uh, new images? No, no new in images uh, on here, uh, on there. Uh, oh, uh, thanks for sharing your image, um, uh, Kev, of uh, shoots back at your studio. Uh, I was highly amused when you commented that uh, the uh, that the model wasn't wearing a mask. Oh yes, she is, just not over the fair, over the mouth uh, on there. So nothing new on there. Oh, and even yeah, right. That was the image I was trying to share. Sorry, it's just been a bit of a big disaster tonight, hasn't it? Right, back to where we are on here. Learning Lightroom. The, white, the uh, YouTube channel is up and running. You'll find in the margins over that way uh, a link to it if you want to uh, have a look at some of the videos on there. And trust me, they work better than this live stream did tonight uh, on that. So just to wrap up, thanks for watching, folks. Thanks for bearing with us. Thanks to Rick for taking part, everyone else for your contributions tonight. Sorry, it's just been an absolute shambles. Uh, on it do subscribe we will get better um, on there comment like etc and next week we're looking at flowers next week in particular a topic of flower scapes so please in during this week put your flower photos flower scapes if you've got them but if not just general flower photos in the facebook group you can Put other things in there as well, but uh, any flower ones are the ones I'll be looking for to share and talk about the, uh, um, uh, on the way to, uh, on the uh, the stream next week. So, yep, there we go. Right, so that brings me to the end. And uh, as ever, folks, thanks for watching. And until next time, keep making great photos. Bye for now. Right, time for the alternative ending for the cut down version when I eventually uh, uh, do that. So here goes. Thanks for watching this uh, cut down version. My apologies for all the problems that we had with the, the sound on, uh, uh, on this particular uh, live stream. Uh, the full version of this uh, will be up on my Academy uh, site. To join that, the instructions are on the screen behind me. It's only £6 a month or £60 a year. And there's lots of resources and training videos which I'm working on uh, for there. So hopefully I'll see you in the Academy at some point. Until then, keep making great photos and thanks for watching. <music>